Hello, everybody. My name is um, Adrian Bullier. I'm a senior project advisor at the CINEA, so the uh, European Climate Innovation, Infrastructure and Environment Executive Agency. Um, we're a new agency that was just recently created, and we're going to be pretty much the Green Deal agency for the next seven years. Um, and we manage uh, quite a number of programs that are related to environment and energy. Um, and in particular, we're, ma we're managing the LIFE program. And as you may have heard already, um, in the LIFE program for the next seven years, we'll have four sub programs. And one of them is the Clean Energy Transition sub program, uh, which is basically the continuation of what we've been doing under the energy efficiency call of Horizon 2020. Um, so if you've got any questions on the LIFE program, you can always visit um, the LIFE stand in the virtual fair um, tomorrow afternoon. And there's also an info session tomorrow afternoon um, at 2.30. Um, so this, uh, this session is part of this trend that's related to innovative solutions to finance energy efficiency and renewables. And, and basically what we're looking at here is, is how we can make sustainable energy investments as attractive as a car loan for banks and investors. So it's got to be simple, it's got to be readable, something you can sell. So th there's many ways that you can do. Um, but one key route that, that we're gonna to investigate today is how you can reduce the risk that's related to the actual savings you achieve with energy efficiency investments. Um, so together with us today, we've got uh, Daniel Magallon. He's the managing director of the Basel Agency for Sustainable Energy, BASE. And um, he's going to tell us about two really interesting projects, which we've been funding for now a few years, um, at least for the first one. And they're basically looking at two ways to do risk investment. One is how you can provide an insurance on the energy savings. Um, and the other one is replacing the provision of energy efficient equipment by the provision of energy efficiency as a service. Uh, which basically guarantees that you will get the um, energy efficiency and not just the equipment. So, Daniel, the floor is yours. You've got 30 minutes. Um, I'll give you a bit of a tick uh, when you've got five minutes left, and then uh, we'll leave uh, five, uh, we'll leave 10, 15 minutes at the end for questions and answers from, from, um, from participants. Please keep yourselves muted and um, and if you've got any questions, please put them in the chat. Um, we'll, we'll try to take them uh, at the end. Daniel, the floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you, Adrian. And thank you, everyone, for having me. I, it's a pleasure to be talking this year virtually um, uh, and, and be present, and presenting these two projects that are being funded by the, by the European Commission. So my presentation is going to be divided in three. The first part, I'm going to talk a little bit about the context of energy efficiency in SMEs. Then the second part, I'm going to be talking about one of our business models that is called the energy savings insurance. And the third part, I'm going to be talking about another business model that we call uh, efficiency as a service. Uh, just to give you a little bit about uh, an overview of what we do, BASE is a non-for-profit entity based in Switzerland. And we are... Uh, celebrating this year, actually 20 years of the foundation of BASE. Uh, we are dedicated to develop innovative financial mechanisms and business models uh, around the world to help to accelerate solutions to climate change. So we have been working a lot in renewables, in energy efficiency, energy access, electric mobility, and as well, um, a lot of work has been done with financial institutions. This is more or less the, the, the map of the places where we have been active. Uh, basically, um, we, we have projects uh, in different places. Um, and now uh, I'm gonna move to the next one. Well, now let's, let's talk about um, energy efficiency and the, the main characteristics on how do we see these type of things. First, when we talk about energy efficiency, we normally talk about small scale projects. So these are not the large uh, wind farms, as we know. Uh, second, uh, they require a little bit more of investment, uh, initial investment than a conventional solution. And this is a, a, a very big barrier for many of the, of the stakeholders that take a decision. Um, 
because that creates lack of trust. Uh, if you see in the right uh, side of your screen, you will see a graphic where initially you have to pay more, maybe 15, 20% more uh, for a high, uh, high end energy efficiency uh, solution, comparing this with a conventional solution. Uh, but obviously in the long term, the, uh, the operational costs are lower than the, than the conventional solution. So this is where a lot of stakeholders have the problem because they have to believe now that paying this additional uh, uh, difference, they are going to get these benefits in the future. Um, and that's where um, the experience uh, dealing with different providers uh, has shown that uh, not always is, is like that. And, and there's some, um, some uh, risk associated with these investments. And the other fact is that energy efficiency compete with other investment priorities that enterprises or other stakeholders have. And this is always um, uh, the fact. So not, as, we, as we know, energy efficiency has been categorized as a non-sexy part of, of the climate change solutions. So it's not, it's not an investment priority, basically. Uh, as well, uh, I'm going to refer a little bit about uh, enterprises, as, as the topic is energy efficiency in enterprises and SMEs. Um, uh, just to give you a little bit of flavor of how, how much money is needed in order to address the European commitments in terms of, of climate change and energy efficiency. Well, it's estimated that a, a round of 300 billion per year is required, from which um, uh, 19 billion is, should be, be directed to the industry in terms of energy efficiency. Uh, and how much money is invested at the moment? Well, it's around 5 billion. So that means that every year we are uh, not investing 40 billion euros in, in the, into this market of energy efficiency. These figures are quite challenging, what, what, quite difficult to get. It's not so easy to, to get what's, what's needed and what it's, how much has been invested. So uh, there's quite a lot of information out there that is disaggregated and is challenging to put together. As well, we have to recognize that when we talk about enterprises, um, well, in Europe, there are around 25 million enterprises, a little bit, a little bit more, from which 99.8% are SMEs. So the majority of these are SMEs. Yes, in terms of uh, individual consumption, the large companies consumes quite a lot. If we talk about cement companies or, or petrochemical companies, they consume quite a lot, but collectively, SMEs actually consume a considerable amount of energy. And this has been not the, 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 the policies and, the, and the, the governments have not put too much attention to this. It's even very difficult to find out how much energy is consumed by the SMEs. There's some research that actually is not very new. Uh, for example, in Italy in 2011, they estimate that 70% of the total industry consumption is coming from SMEs, while in the UK is almost the half of the energy is coming from SMEs. In China, it's 2.5 uh, the energy of, of, of large uh, companies. In the US is half and in Australia as well is the half. So uh, this is a very important issue because if you think about the policies in place are designed to push and, and, and to force the large enterprises and the large consumers to invest in energy efficiency, not necessarily the SMEs. And as well, normally the packages that are designed to finance these type of things are not exactly very well suited or designed for small and medium sized enterprises. So there's a very big opportunity there to improve in terms of energy efficiency in, in enterprises. Um, and, and the next one, I want to put this analogy to think a little bit about what this implies. So imagine uh, you have a donkey and to move the donkey, you have uh, two options. You have the stick, which means that basically the policies of the regulation in place and you have the carrot. If you don't have a very strong policy in place, then obviously that donkey is not going to move unless they have a very attractive carrot in the other side. 
And the problem that energy efficiency has is that there are many different carrot possibilities for that donkey. So here the question is, how do we make that carrot that we call energy efficiency more attractive than the other uh, opportunities or investment opportunities that this enterprise might have? I, 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 I want to as well uh, reflect in this graphic which is a very simplistic way on, on to show how the decision investment decision is made in an enterprise. And here we have, we have three different investment opportunities. Uh, 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 first, to put the money in a bank account, in a saving account. The second one is the investment in, in, the, in, in the enterprise, in the core business. And the third option is in terms of investing in the stock market. So each of these options have a different uh, risk return trade-off and uh, obviously more risky more risk perception uh, is going to be higher as well the return expectation so here the question is where is energy efficiency when we are uh, uh, comparing with this normally is being perceived as a very high risk we know that there are very good investment opportunities out there where where the returns can compete with other investment opportunities but in terms of risk uh, and, the, and this relationship of risk return uh, sometimes is not so attractive compared to other investment opportunities. So here the challenge is how do we move that, uh, that bubble of, of, of that circle of energy efficiency to the left and obviously uh, to, 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 to more uh, return. Sometimes it's difficult to move on the expected return because this is a, a technical aspect related with efficiency, with equipment, with the energy price. Um, and sometimes the financing cost, uh, but the, the risk, you can play a lot as well uh, with this. So here, um, th there's a lot of reflection on what kind of solutions we can put in place in order to reduce this risk. Um, and well, here I'm gonna present these two uh, business models that we have been implementing uh, uh, in different countries. Uh, for instance, the energy saving insurance, we started actually implementing this in, in Latin America uh, with some support from the Danish government. Then we uh, as well start replicating this in Europe, in Spain, Portugal, and Italy. And now uh, we are expanding in Europe uh, to other countries, uh, to Greece, Croatia, and Slovakia. And efficiency as a service as well, born as an, a global project where we start supporting projects in in Latin America, Africa, Asia, Singapore. Uh, and now we have a program that is focused in Belgium, in, in Netherlands and in Spain. So the first one, the energy saving insurance, uh, uh, as I was saying, this is a, a model that has been operating already. There's a, a, a pipeline of projects that have been financed uh, in, in Latin America and as well in Europe it's already in operation in Spain, Portugal, and Italy, and it will be in operation in next year in, in Greece, uh, Slovakia, and Croatia. Um, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip this one as I explain it. It's, it's basically composed of four mechanisms. The, the first one, it's, it's um, a contract, and the contract basically um, we, we were analyzing how these type of deals are normally done, which most of the deals in terms of energy efficiency is under the standard supply and installation uh, contract. So there's a provider that sells you an equipment. Uh, you have to believe that the savings and the efficiency of the equipment is gonna be, is gonna come. So what we have done is just basically to take that contract and we added some guarantee clauses and the basic point of this contract uh, is to say what happens if the savings are not achieved. So basically the provider is responsible for the savings and is responsible for compensating to the customer in case that the savings are not uh, achieved. So in this case, for an example, if I sell uh, an, uh, an air conditioning system to to Adrian that is going to save 20% and these savings are not achieved, that it only achieved 15%, this contract basically what it says is that me as a contractor as a provider have to compensate to adrian five percent as this was the savings that were not achieved then comes an insurance the insurance basically is is guaranteeing the guarantee that i'm providing to the client so that means that in the case that there's a 
uh, underperformance. Uh, again, returning to this example of the 20% that I promised and it was only 50% and I have to pay, but I don't want to pay or I disappear or uh, whatever reason the, the, the provider don't want to comply with the commitment, then there is an insurance that will uh, guarantee to the customer, to the client, to the SME, that they are going to receive the savings that were promised at the beginning. And that's that's where actually the whole uh, uh, thing change. If you recall this graphic of the risk return, uh, that's what we are aiming to do with this contract and with this insurance to move the the, the investments in energy efficiency to the left side, where is very low risk perception on this. As based in, in other words, what what the energy saving insurance model is doing is to guarantee the future cash flows of the of, for the investor in these type of things. Now. Uh, we identified that there's a problem in this because, uh, well, the contract uh, established the, these commitments and established as well the timing. Every time that, uh, that we have to measure this, it has to be, uh, there has to be a report. So normally we, uh, uh, the contract and the guarantees for five years and it's established that every year the provider and the customer have to uh, measure, but basically the one, the one that does the report is the provider. And in the case that there is a disagreement between the, these two parties, um, then the insurance will be in a position that they, they will not know to who to believe, if they have to believe to the customer or they have to believe to the, to the provider. So we incorporate uh, a referee, basically a technical referee uh, that it's uh, as well uh, established and recognized by both parties in the contract. And this figure of the referee that we call the technical validation is very important for the insurance company because now the insurance company have uh, an independent entity that is not the client and it's not the, the, the contractor or the, or the provider that is, is evaluating if really the project achieved the savings or not. So uh, th that figure becomes quite fundamental for, uh, for the uh, insurance companies. And as well, we have the financing. We uh, recognize that a lot of these projects require financing uh, to be executed, especially if they are SMEs. And uh, in these terms, the, the financing or the banks, they are not involved in this uh, agreement, in this contract between the provider and the customer, but they like the idea of having a, a client that they are lending uh, and that the, this client has a project where the cash flows basically are, are guaranteed for uh, in, in the next years. So that obviously uh, has have an impact in terms of having uh, access to, to, the, to the credit. Here's a very simple uh, financial uh, flow of, of the different stakeholders. So we have in the middle to the SME, uh, in the bottom we have a square that is called technology provider. So basically this is the the agreement that they have, if you, if you see the, the bubble, the black bubble on the right side, the technology provider commits to implement, to supply and install an uh, energy efficiency project. And this energy efficiency project should deliver some energy savings to the SME. To guarantee these energy savings, we have an insurance uh, that is providing this um, risk coverage product where the beneficiary of this risk coverage product, product is the SME. It, and, and this is, this is uh, something that I want to highlight. Uh, this is about the relationship between the, uh, the enterprise or the customer and the provider. In a separate agreement, we have, uh, and we might have uh, an SME that approach a financial institution. And they might sign a, a loan agreement that is independent from the contract. And in this case, uh, we are helping and facilitating access to uh, or approaching financial institutions and as well uh, approaching some credit guarantees that might facilitate the access to the, to the SME. As you can see here, uh, it's very interesting because the, the insurance has kind of the same function as the credit guarantee, but the beneficiary are differently. So in the case of insurance, as, as I was saying, the beneficiary is the SME. In the case of the credit guarantee, the beneficiary is a financial institution. Um, so uh, we normally, uh, we as base, we don't, we don't sell insurance, we don't sell equipment. 
we are just facilitating the whole process and we are helping the different stakeholders in these different countries. And we work with local insurance companies uh, and, and work with them in order to offer uh, this type of, of risk coverage product. This product is something that, is, uh, that exists in the markets. Uh, it's something that is something that is not uh, created as a new product because that will create a lot of problems with their, with their national regulators. So normally we are using something that is called a surety bond uh, that is very common in the construction sector and it's very similar to a bank guarantee with the difference that a bank guarantee actually uh, what the bank does is to block a certain amount of money in your bank account. In this case, the insurance, they don't do that. They just uh, do an evaluation of the provider and according to the financial evaluation, they extend this guarantee that is based on the commitments established in the contract between the provider and the, and the customer. Um, and as well, well, we have the, the validation entity, I, I, the, this figure that I was mentioning, the referee. In this case, in Europe, uh, we engage SGS, which is a certification company, a Swiss certification company. And we ask them to provide, uh, not only the, 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 to play the role of the referee, but as well to provide a technical opinion at the beginning of the project. So when the client is evaluating the proposal, uh, and the, and is, is signing the contract, basically SGS has to, has to provide an opinion in terms of uh, if the project has the capacity or not to deliver the savings that, they, that the provider is promising to the customer. And as well, we use them to do the first, um, uh, to, to do a verification of the installation. So just make sure that the equipment that was installed is the same equipment that was promised and that the monitoring equipment that is going to be used to measure the savings is in place. So that's, that's, um, that point is actually uh, is the starting point of the guarantee that goes up to five years. As well, we have, we have uh, established an online uh, management information system. Uh, so as you uh, realize, uh, the, the, the provider has to do this annual reporting and they have to, um, uh, uh, present this to the customer and the customer has to approve these reports. So what we have done in order to facilitate this communication, we have established this online reporting that is based on a blockchain platform. Uh, and basically uh, the, the stakeholders that are involved into this project have access to this information. So the insurance company has access to the information uh, of this reporting and as well uh, the client can give access to the bank so they can uh, follow up the, the, the performance of the energy efficiency project. What kind of technologies are financed through the energy saving insurance? Well, it's uh, uh, different types of, of equipments that are used in the, in the industry. Uh, that could be the commercial sector or the industrial sector that goes from motors, lighting, cogeneration, air conditioning, refrigeration, boilers, solar water heaters, solar photovoltaics. Uh, interestingly here, we are talking about investments that goes from 50,000 euros up to 2 million euros. Uh, and then the question is why, why 50,000 euros? Well, it's just um, to cover the transaction costs in, in order that makes sense. So, the insurance has a cost. The cost is around 1% of the total value of the project and you are insured up to five years of the, of the contract. But as well, the, the, the validation cost, the initial validation that is provided by, uh, by SGS has a cost of around 2,500 euros, which if you put this in terms of a percentage of a project that costs 10,000 is already 25% of the project. So it doesn't make too, too much sense to spend 25% just in the validation when it's about a 100,000 100, euros project and pay 2,500 uh, 2, uh, 2, euros. Well, it's 2.5%, it, it, it makes sense to, to expand this amount. So that's why the limitation is not that we are putting the, a limit, it's only that the conditions themselves put a limit to the to the different projects that we are uh, promoting. 
We are initially focusing in Spain, Portugal, and Italy in different sectors. Uh, initially, we start focusing in the hotel industry in Italy and Spain and in Portugal. Um, well, well, unfortunately, with the with the COVID situation, these sectors have been quite affected, and now they are starting little by little uh, um, incorporating and recovering from the economic crisis. But as well, we focus in the food processing industry, the textile industry, uh, and the supermarkets in in uh, in Italy. So um, that that was our strategy. We we have been working with commercial insurance companies in these different countries. Uh, we have very engaged uh, insurance companies that are basically using their existing product. They are shifting a little bit the product to, to energy efficiency. So these are the insurance companies that we are working with. And I'm going to finish now the explanation of ESI uh, at this point. Now I'm going to talk about the second model that is called efficiency as a service. And in the efficiency as a service, the model is a little bit different uh, than the first one. In, in this place, is a servitization model or a pay, pay per service model. Um, basically the customer, they don't have to invest. They just pay for the outcome of the, of the equipment that is being installed. So in other words, the ownership of the asset is never in the hands of the customer. It's always on the hands of the provider. And the, the provider basically put a, a fee uh, for a unit uh, uh, and, a, and a contract that basically it's between five and 10 years in order to allow the uh, amortization of the investment. So imagine uh, the, the, the most simple uh, uh, servitization example is, is your water or your electricity that you purchase from uh, the utility. You don't invest, uh, you, you don't buy the, 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 the power uh, generator of the utility, you just, you just pay for the electricity bill that you receive every, every month. So in the same way, uh, if, a, I don't know, a, a compressed air uh, solution provider that is signing an a, a efficiency as a service contract with a customer, what he's selling in practice are cubic meters of compressed air per month. Or if you are uh, uh, air conditioning system, you are selling tons of refrigeration. Or if you are um, uh, a provider of lighting, then you are selling lighting as a service. And this is something that uh, has been growing in the market in the last years. Uh, as I said, this is something that is not new. Uh, have been sectors that have been many, many years in the servitization sector. One of the probably the most famous one is Xerox with their copier machines. Uh, you might know the, them that you can ask for a copier machine from Xerox. You, you don't buy the copier machine. You just pay per number of copies at the end of the month. So the principle is the same. Now we have companies like Philips that they are offering lighting as a service. So I think the, the airport in Amsterdam, it's uh, offered uh, by Philips. The lighting service is offered by Philips in a, in a lighting as a service to the to the airport uh, authorities. Um, what are the rationale of, of this model? Well, the benefits for the customer is obviously there's no capital expenditure. So uh, there's no distraction of capital. So I don't have to compete with their investment opportunities uh, as well um, being the fact that this is a high efficient equipment uh, uh, in terms of the equipment plus the operational expenses, it should be lower than the uh, existing equipment that is inefficient or a conventional equipment. The other advantage that these type of contracts have is that it's off balance. So this is not affecting your credit capacity. Uh, the, there's uh, a lot of discussions about what are the similarities with the ESCO model, especially with the say, uh, share savings uh, contract. The share savings contract, basically what the contract does is make that, um, obliges that the, 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 pro the provider or the ESCO and the customer, they sit every year to negotiate the savings because according to the savings, the ESCO is being paid. Not in this case. In this case, there's no uh, negotiations of savings. So what we have been pushing is actually the, the provider selling a complete package that includes equipment, includes the energy price and includes the maintenance. So at the end, 
there's a quite big incentive from the provider to keep the equipment to the maximum efficiency, uh, because obviously the, if, the, if the equipment is not efficient, then they end up paying the energy. And as well to keep the equipment to the high, uh, to a good, with a good maintenance and a good operation. Uh, so you, they, they maximize the, the returns. Uh, basically, uh, as well for the customer, they are, what you are doing in practice, you are outsourcing completely the service and you are uh, delegating this to someone that knows how to operate the, the equipment. So, Daniel, just uh, you have three minutes left, sorry. Yeah. And uh, as well, well, for the technology provider, uh, that's as well an, a, a way to distinguish from the competitors. Uh, you are generating a cash flow uh, uh, that helps you to... Uh, basically uh, predict very well your income in the future. And as well, for there's a quite a lot of opportunities for financial institutions in place that we are exploring. So here are the different um, uh, technologies and services that are now offered by servitization. You might recognize some of them already. This has changed a lot in the last year because of digitalization. So now you can actually uh, uh, pay for a scooter, an electric scooter in the street just with a... Uh, um, a mobile phone. So all this, this digitalization has helped a lot to bring down the servitization and to make it more accessible. Uh, we are, have a set of um, support for these companies to, to implement this in these three countries, in Belgium, in Netherlands and Spain. But, but basically, uh, there's a lot of support in terms of helping these companies to analyze the pricing of this. Now, imagine that these companies are good in selling uh, equipment systems, but not necessarily, they have very clear the pricing, the contractual arrangement, now they have to sign a, 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 as a service contract, and as well the financial structure behind which there's quite a lot of, of different financial structures that includes special proposed vehicles, sale and lease back on aggregation and securitization that could be implemented in the different stages of the project. It could be uh, at the beginning when in the supplier construction and the operation uh, or the, during the operation to try to capitalize the project. So I'm not going to go into details into this, um, but that's part of the things that we are uh, working at the moment with different stakeholders, the providers, the financial institutions, private equity funds, and insurance companies to try to mainstream the servitization model for energy efficiency. I'm going to stop now so we can pass to the, to the questions, Adrian. All right. Thanks a lot, Daniel, for this excellent presentation. Um, we've got two questions already. Um, so I'm, I'm going to pick the ones that are for, for, every, uh, for everybody's, everybody's interest, but maybe you can tell us about whether that applies to public clients or just private clients because of the question on Eurostat rules. Um, and then um, Asen Chaliski had, um, had questions also on the duration of the insurance, um, so can it, how long can it last? And is it on the company level or on the project level? Um, and so, yeah, how is, that, how is that interlinked basically? Yeah, so regarding the first question, uh, we, we are focusing obviously in, the, in Europe with the, with the private uh, projects, with private enterprises. However, the, we have, we have been implementing efficiency as a service in other countries, especially in Costa Rica, um, where we are implementing this for the public sector, where here we are linking this with the uh, procurement process or the legal procurement process for service for services. Um, and this has to be multi-annual in order to guarantee that the provider is going to recover. So applies for both, uh, actually, for the public and the private. And I think we are going to see more and more in both sides, in the public and the private sector, as a service type of models. Uh, in terms of the of the first question, um, the the insurance at the moment is uh, by standard in Europe up to five years. So you pay one percent, and you are guaranteed up to five years of your energy savings. However, this could be extended, um, and this depends a lot on the condition. So there's no uh, regulation that restricts that time. It, I think it's more about the provider um, uh, financial strength uh, and the perception and the evaluation that the insurance does on the 
on the company. It's not an evaluation on the project, it's an evaluation on the company itself. So if the, if the provider is very robust, has been in the market for 20, 25 years, has very good financial, um, uh, financial um, uh, reporting and uh, a balance sheet uh, and, and, and credit worthiness uh, for the insurance company is a straightforward uh, to extend this guarantee because they know that that company is not going to fail co to comply with the commitments. So that's, I think, the beauty of this product that is not going to the details of the technical details of the project. It's not evaluating project by project. It's evaluating the provider that it's, it's guaranteeing that project uh, in a specific. So uh, in, in, the, in the standard way that they do this is they evaluate a, a provider and they extend a kind of a, uh, like a revolving fund, but in this case are guarantees because there's no money uh, uh, given. So they tell to the company, okay, according to your financials, we can give you guarantees up to 1 million euros. And the, it's up to the provider to do, uh, distribute and allocate these uh, 1 million per year guarantees to the different projects. So that's normally the way that it works. Great. Um, do we have any more questions from the audience? I also have got tons of questions myself, but uh, I think it's, uh, it's also the opportunity for you to ask. Um, maybe Danielle, um, you can tell us a bit um, in terms of uptake, uh, and I know that the, the two projects are not at the same uh, at the same stage. But but you know, do you have um, figures on the market that you've that, that you've um, the turnover, the, the number of um, investments, and the volume that you've uh, managed to support with the two. Um, and I was wondering also two more specific questions on. Litigation cases, do you have a lot? Um, and, and also the interaction from basically the, the shift from the insurance and savings and the actual credit guarantee, you were saying you could help, but how does it work concretely for banks to accept basically that the insurance will play the role of a guarantee? Yeah. So, well, yeah, we, we are in the final stage of the energy saving insurance. Uh, we are just starting with efficiency as a service pro program. Uh, in, the, in the energy saving insurance, we uh, this last year, we are supposed to build a, a pipeline of projects that around 20 million euros per, per country that we are targeting, meaning Spain, Portugal, and Italy. Um, Unfortunately, a lot of the momentum and a lot of the um, inertia that we have built at the beginning of 2020 were diluted because of the COVID. So as you might realize, a lot of the investments were uh, um, stopped, uh, especially in the sectors that we were betting, which is the, the hotel sector. Now we are restarting, uh, I would say we have a couple of months that there's quite a lot of action in terms of uh, evaluation of projects. We have a pipeline already uh, undergoing that includes uh, a school in Portugal, includes uh, an industry in Spain, and includes as well uh, uh, a financial institution in, in Italy. Uh, and we are expecting that these ramp ups in the next months, uh, which is our final stage of the project, which we are doing, trying to do our best. We, we have a, a pipeline, we have a, a, a already projects that have been uh, and countries that have been implementing this and the market has been taking up uh, the energy saving insurance model very well. So and this is what we are aiming to do as well in Spain, where the provider understand this as a tool to facilitate the sale to the customer. So I'm selling you an equipment that yes, it's more expensive, but yes, it generates more savings. And if you don't believe me, I give you, a, I sign a contract and I give you an insurance. So that start creating quite a very strong um, bond with the customer. Um, uh, and then, yeah, the, the, the second question was about, about the- About litigations. Yeah. Uh, it's, sorry, mitigations on what? How do you often get litigation cases? Ah, litigation. No, no. Uh, at the moment, I, uh, well, I don't know, but we have been very fortunate to don't have even even 
any insurance trigger. I think we have the role of the validation entity has been quite a good buffer for this. We have had cases where, um, uh, unfortunately, in some countries, for example, when the when the project was ready to start and the and the validation entity went to verify that the equipment that was installed uh, was the same equipment that was sold, they found found out that actually the equipment was a second hand equipment, but. Uh, uh, I mean, that the only way to identify that is, is with the validation entity actually, and that worked very well. And that actually the, they changed the equipment and then at that moment, the insurance start operating normally. So we have had not any claim. I think these type of products are made to build trust and not necessarily people is looking or the providers are looking that this is triggered because that creates a very bad reputation for the provider. Yeah, no, I, I think that's, uh... What, what I think is interesting is that actually it's not used. <laughs> yeah. Um, and then my, my last question, but unless uh, anybody in the room has uh, has additional questions you want to ask, was was uh, how you transfer, how you go from an insurance on energy savings to a credit guarantee for the bank, which is which yeah. would be a separate transaction. It is, it is differently. However, we have been in countries like in the case of Italy and the case of Colombia, where the banks have realized about uh, some kind of benefit from the insurance and they have been requesting to the customer to endorse the benefit of the insurance to the bank, which means that in the case that the insurance is triggered, the one that is going to receive the money is not going to be the SME, it's going to be the bank directly then the bank in exchange reduces the interest rate to the customer. So okay, that so has been interesting. Yeah, so remember the, the graphic that was the insurance was going directly to the SME. Well, in this case goes up to the financial institution, um, which that has been a, an interesting development from the, from the insurance itself. So uh, that's, that's something. And the other thing that we have learned is that um, when the banks understand the model itself, they just have to ask to the customer, listen, I'm going to lend you this, but please make sure to have the insurance because that obviously will guarantee you that you're going to have the cash flow to pay me back the credit. So that uh, as well. And, and do you think you're at the stage or you would soon be at the stage where where you can engage with banks and, and that demand would come from banks or do you still need to push the market with, uh, with the providers, with project development and so on? Because ultimately this is what would trigger yeah. a large scale rollout. I think we, we are at the moment pushing from all the different angles. Uh, we, are, we are working with providers to try to engage them and convince them to, on the benefits of the model itself. As well, we are approaching customers. So the message has been, you know, listen, when you have a project, just pay a little bit of amount of money and you will have a guaranteed project with the savings for the next five years. And as well, we are working, we are trying to convince banks and financial institutions to uh, start kind of offering this, this as, a, as a mainstream standard product in, in the market. So. We are uh, trying all the different angles, uh, as, as you might imagine, uh, banks and all these entities are bombarded with different messages from the market. So it's, it's always very difficult to position uh, the solution uh, in, in the market. Okay, well, I think this session is coming to an end. Um, I'd like to ask uh, everybody to give a virtual round of applause for Danielle. Um, who's made, um, so you can hear me clapping, um, so who made a really great presentation. Um, those who are interested in this trend, so please stay tuned. Um, the next uh, next session is starting at three with me again, and we'll be looking uh, more into standardization of uh, sustainable energy assets with uh, with dual assets and uh, work that is very linked to what, uh, what Daniel is doing. And I think there are some very concrete interactions. Um, and for those who are interested in other sessions, uh, you've got a 15 minute break anyway, and we continue at three. So thanks a lot for your attention. And thanks again to Danielle for this presentation.
Thank you, Bye. Adrian. Thank you, everyone.